Wireless in chain, supply chain attacks using machine learning models. I will give you another stage. Great stuff, thank you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, my name's Tom Bonner. I'm VP of Research at Hidden Layer, where we look into uh, sort of AI security. Um, so we cover everything from sort of yeah, supply chain and model file format issues to inference attacks against predictive AI, generative AI, things like that. Um, I'm joined by Marta, um, my colleague. She's a principal security researcher looking into AI uh, threats. And yeah, today we're going to be focusing on sort of the AI supply chain, looking at um, models, how they can be subverted and abused, and, and how some of the um, sort of serialization formats are susceptible to attack. So I'll hand over to Marta to kick things off. All right. So um, in this presentation, we will cover uh, a few issues uh, uh, that we found with uh, machine learning models and uh, specifically with the serialization formats that are used uh, to serialize those models. Uh, we will uh, walk through uh, some scenarios in which we will hijack models, uh, PyTorch model, Keras, TensorFlow, and then we will also mention some flows in ONNX uh, R and scopes. Uh, we will also look at uh, a technique called model steganography, uh, which can be used to uh, hide the uh, malicious payloads inside machine learning models, uh, and we will uh, look at uh, a couple of different issues that we came across. So first of all, uh, we live in an era of supply chain attacks. Everybody is familiar with supply chain attacks. Uh, those became the favorite method of uh, cyber criminals to extort money or uh, conduct espionage um, uh, operations. Uh, and over the years, uh, we've heard those big names such as SolarWinds, Kaseya, Log4j, more recently, XZ Backdoor. Uh, all of those uh, breaches were very, very devastating and uh, were also very lucrative for the cyber criminals. This is due to, uh, to uh, two factors. One is uh, exploiting the trust between uh, the supplier and uh, the, the, the clients, customers of that supplier. And the other one is the reach. So uh, the cyber criminals can breach just one supplier one network, uh, and uh, gain uh, um, uh, foothold in uh, many of the uh, these suppliers' uh, customers. Uh, and in this, in this presentation, we will look at how uh, cyber criminals could use uh, the growing machine learning field, uh, uh, the, the, the growing um, hype with AI, uh, in order to uh, mm, do uh, some supply chain attacks and fly under the radar. So, uh, as we said, we live in an era of supply chain attacks, and we also live in an era of AI. <laughs> so, last year was all about chat GPT, um, stable diffusion, uh, image generation models, uh, copilots uh, of, of different types, but AI is not just generative AI, and there is a lot of models out there that are much simpler than that, uh, and they are used across all industries, and uh, most of the companies, most of the businesses are use, uh, utilizing AI in this or um, other manner. So one of the metrics that we use on um, to gouge how uh, quickly the AI um, technology is growing uh, is looking at ha hugging face. Hugging face is a, a repository of pre-trained uh, publicly available models. It's uh, something like a GitHub for machine learning models. Uh, and uh, when we started, uh, hugging face was uh, uh, about like 100 maybe 200,000 uh, models, oh, that was like one year ago, and uh, uh, right now we can see that uh, this number, 735, is already outdated because uh, I, I update, updated the slides two days ago, so today it's going to be probably around uh, 750 models, 1,000 uh, mo models on uh, on a hugging face. Uh, so... Uh, Lots of companies are using those pre-trained models because it's easier, it's uh, uh, less time-consuming, uh, it's uh, cheaper uh, to, to, to start building your own uh, AI uh, application based on already trained model. Uh, and uh, those repositories, uh, unfortunately, are not very well protected at the moment. And machine learning models are not protected at all at the moment as well. So, uh, yeah, we, we like to say that machine learning uh, security right now is like security of software in the 90s. So uh, there are 
no signatures, no uh, digital certificates for machine learning artifacts, so nothing is signed. Uh, there are barely any integrity checks. Sometimes you get like a checksum of a model uh, and that's it, but uh, people are not really used to checking those either. Uh, there is no uh, malware scanning for uh, machine learning models, so uh, current, uh, current anti-malware solutions usually don't even touch machine learning models because those are huge, right? Some, some of the models can be uh, more than 100 gigabytes and scanning something like that for malicious code it is tedious. You need to actually know what you are looking for. You can't just scan it like uh, byte by byte. Uh, and uh, well, on top of that, the code uh, in which um, those machine learning frameworks uh, uh, are um, developed is often insecure, uh, and there are some uh, some issues uh, in uh, in uh, serialization formats, for example, uh, that are meant to be features uh, that were designed like um, not for uh, the use of machine learning, for example. And uh, uh, yeah, right now it, it's difficult even to per persuade that those are security issues uh, uh, that they are treated as features, and we get uh, the reply like this one from Google that this is not not a security issue. This is just like how, how these, uh, these models are supposed to work. Run them in the sandbox. But obviously nobody is running their models in the sandbox. <laughs> uh, people are just not used to do that with machine learning models. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, there are quite a, quite a few uh, points on the um, AI supply chain where it can be breached uh, uh, and a supply chain attack can happen. So uh, in this presentation, we are uh, focusing only on uh, the model sourcing stage where uh, we will be talking about hijacked and backdoored models. Uh, but there are other things like uh, the data poisoning that can happen at data collection stage. Uh, there are uh, lots of software vulnerabilities, we will uh, touch on, uh, on that one as well a little bit in this presentation. And there is also prediction tampering, which uh, happens at build and deployment. Uh, so, uh, first of all, we start with, uh, uh, well, defining what's a model. <laughs> so, uh, machine learning model is basically a result of uh, some very complex computations that are run on uh, huge amounts of data. But at the end of the day, those models have to be stored on the disk, have to be transferred of the, over the network, so they have to be serialized as files. So basically, from our perspective, from the security perspective, machine learning models are nothing else than files. And files can be infected with malware, can be exploited, can be abused in many ways. Uh, so uh, we, we found uh, a few different ways uh, that uh, it can be done really, really easily. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's still flying under the radar because there is no, uh, no security around it. Uh, just a quick overview of machine learning uh, serialization formats. There are very many of them. Each of machine learning frameworks has their own preferred formats. Uh, there are Python-based formats, very simple ones like NumPy, Joblib, Pickle, which was uh, actually designed uh, to store uh, Python objects and structures and not really uh, with machine learning in mind. Then we have TorchScript, which is based on Pickle. Uh, we have a Saved Model, uh, which is a tensor... Um, TensorFlow uh, file format and safe tensors, which was uh, designed with security in mind. Then we have cross-platform uh, uh, formats like HDF5, uh, ONNX, Arrow, uh, JSON. Everybody knows JSON. It's one of the simplest ones, and uh, probably right now it's uh, uh, one of the most secure, I would say. PMML, which is based on XMML, uh, and uh, um, yeah, it um, the XML, and it uh, also had its vulnerabilities in the past, and a couple of formats that are used specifically by Java-based frameworks. Um, I'm going to pass to Tom to talk about PyTorch. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so we'll start with Pickle. Um, I don't know, when I when I put my black hat on, I'm always very excited to see Pickle in any um, sort of ML application. I know we're about to hack it and hack it pretty easily. When I got my white hat on, it just makes me sad seeing this. So um, <laughs> if you develop Python before, you're probably quite familiar with Pickle. If you haven't, it's basically um, sort of Python's built-in library for serializing data structures. So you, you can save like dictionaries and lists and strings uh, and load them back up uh, at the other end. Um, I think the most pertinent thing to point out here is the big red warning on the Pickle page. That's been there for well over 10 years. It's, the main point to highlight is the Pickle module is not secure. Only unpickle data you trust. Um, yeah, 
just makes me sad that people haven't really read that or followed it. Or, uh, I don't know if people aren't reading documentation or if they just copy and paste code from Stack Overflow or, or what's going on. But net result is there are lots and lots of uh, ML libraries and uh, ops platforms that are, are using Pickle as, you know, for serializing models, for inter-process communications all over the place. So worth delving into. Um, yeah, so in a nutshell, we can, we can store data. In this example, we're just storing a, a dictionary with a key value pair, uh, to a file called data.pickle. Very easy to just pickle.dump it. Um, we got a simple disassembly on the, the right there, just showing, you know, the, the op codes, uh, within. Um, so yeah, it's creating an empty dictionary, pushing in the key and the value, and then calling set item to recreate the, the list. Um, yeah, under the hood, Pickle is actually a virtual machine, a, a stack-based virtual machine. So it implements about 70 uh, opcodes, uh, and four of these allow for code execution. Um, or kind of five, but um, there is the global, stack global, and um, inst instantiate instructions. Uh, so these will import Python classes and modules and basically pop, uh, well, push them onto the stack. Um, and then there's a reduce instruction. So we can also push arguments to these functions onto the stack and reduce will, will call these functions as we'll, we'll see in a minute. Um, so yeah, you know, just through some simple classes, um, we've, we've got a very simple one here that's uh, implementing like os.system, exec, eval um, commands. We can then, you know, run Python code or run system commands. Um, so in this example on the right, we've, we're injecting into a, a PyTorch model. So, um, PyTorch actually uses pickle under the hood. Um, the, the tensors get stored in a, a zip file as just, sort of flat arrays of floating point numbers and there's a, a pickle file in there that instructs PyTorch on how to reconstruct this all into like multi-dimensional arrays uh, in memory. Um, so we can inject into that pickle and here we're injecting just a simple exec just to prove a point um, and you know a print hello command and when we import torch and load the model just performing the load executes the code and we print hello here. We can do far more nefarious things obviously but very just Short, concise example there. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of scanners out there, a number of open source scanners for checking Pickle for embedded code. Um, a lot of them rely on sort of block lists of Python functions that are bad and shouldn't be seen in Pickles. Unfortunately, I mean, we've got a couple examples here. Just runpy.runcode was introduced in uh, Python 3. Point something. Um, that evaded a lot of the scanners. Um, within PyTorch, there is a, a class called unsupported tensor ops, and in there is a function called exec wrapper that does exactly what it says on the tin. It wraps the exec function. Um, and we found at this point a couple of hundred different, um, different functions within either the Python base modules or, or within sort of um, MLOps libraries that will allow us to execute code. So it's a real nightmare to keep on top of um, sort of code execution functions and develop a, a solid block list. Um, one of my favorites as well was pickling a pickle. Um, that evaded most scanners, I think still does really. Um, and we've, we've seen this in the wild actually. So. Um, a pickle was created that uses exec to execute, well, no, not exec, actually. It was um, os.system to run a, a bin bash command. And um, that was then embedded in another pickle. So by calling pickle.loads on a pickle embedded in a pickle, we can run a command. Um, as I said, we saw that in the wild. We've seen some other things, interesting things in the wild as well, like cobalt strike beacons embedded in pickles. Um, so this one is, you know, fairly simple um, shellcode stager. It's executing some um, writable, executable memory, writing a, a shellcode to it, and then creating a thread, and you follow that all the way through, and you end up with a cobalt stroke beacon at the other end. So we can embed beacons, um, stages, shellcodes. We'll see some other fun stuff in PyTorch models in a bit. We, we've got a demo on that. Um, yeah, go on. Ah, to take us through Keras. All right, so after the pickle, we looked into a Keras uh, um, framework. Keras is one of the most popular machine learning frameworks. It's uh, uh, actually very user-friendly, so it's used by many uh, machine learning engineers. Uh, Keras uses HDF5 storage format, uh, and the format itself was uh, is 
more or less secure, uh, so we didn't find any code execution directly through HDF5, uh, but Keras helps us with that. Uh, so uh, Keras allows uh, for um, executing a code from inside an HDF5 file uh, by using something called Lambda layers. So uh, um, a developer can embed a Lambda layer inside uh, the machine learning model, uh, and uh, that layer can possibly contain uh, malicious code, malicious script that uh, will get executed. So uh, those lambda layers are serialized using Python Marshall module, uh, and the Marshall module is quite similar to Pico module uh, in very many ways. Uh, um, so um, to dump uh, code into, uh, into a Marshall structure, we use Marshall dumps function, and likewise we use uh, Marshall loads function to actually load uh, this code back. But if we go to Marshall documentation page, we can see our very familiar warning uh, that Marshall module is not safe and uh, shouldn't be used with untrusted data. So this is the situation, as, uh, the same situation as with uh, the Pico module. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, um, we can uh, create a, a a malicious Keras model, just as we did with Pico. So uh, in this example, we simply um, uh, compile a script. This is a, a simple script printing out hello on the console, but it can be any code. Uh, then we can uh, dump it to uh, a Marshall structure. Uh, and if we open it in hex editor, it will look something like that. Uh, and uh, we constructed a script, uh, uh, a similar injection script to, to the Pico injection uh, using uh, those um, most uh, uh, well-known uh, Python execution function like execval system and also the uh, undocumented runpy function, which is a little bit flying under the radar. Uh, and with the use of this script, we created a, a Keras model uh, that... Uh, upon loading would uh, print out our uh, malicious statement. So uh, from the perspective of, um, of incident responder or a digital forensic or a reverse engineer, if we open a Keras model in a, in a hex editor, it will look uh, more or less like that. So the original model is on the left, uh, the hijacked on the right, and we can see that there is something called lambda in the hijacked model and some base64 encoded string. Uh, the thing is, well, not all lambda layers will be malicious. I mean, there is some uh, legit um, legit uh, reason to use those lambda layers, so uh, we need to analyze uh, the actual code of that lambda layer, and for that we need to, obviously, base64 decode it, uh, then we can use the Python uh, disassembler to uh, print out the disassembly of this lambda layer. And we can see that it looks pretty much similar to what we saw with uh, pickle disassembly. So there is a load uh, global uh, instruction that will load uh, our exec function. Uh, then there is load const, which will uh, push our argument on the stack, uh, which uh, is our malicious script. Uh, and then uh, there is a call function uh, instruction, which will do exactly that. So call our exec with, with our uh, our um, parameter. And the parameter can be, again, any Python code. Uh, and likewise with the Pico, we found some uh, malicious Keras models in the wild. Most of them are probably researchers playing around or maybe attackers just testing things out, printing out infected or something like that. But we also found uh, more complicated uh, samples recently uh, that were using some uh, steganography payloads inside. Uh, and I'm going to pass for a TensorFlow to Tom. Cool. So TensorFlow. Um... Interesting one, TensorFlow. It's got sort of two modes of operation. So in eager mode, um, it'll execute operations immediately. And you can embed Python functions um, sort of into your um, your neural network to help debug things. You can look at inputs and outputs to layers, um, check activations, things like that. You cannot, however, serialize those Python functions to disk. So there's no way to do Python code execution through TensorFlow. However, in graph mode, this is sort of how TensorFlow models are serialized. So they're, they're saved as like a protobuf, um, and you, you store a sort of computational graph. It's optimized for speed and efficiency, so it's highly portable. You can ship it around to any system, uh, load it up and use it. Uh, and it's, it's used primarily in sort of production environments. Um, the save model itself is a uh, protobuf. Um, 
as, as, as you said, it, it's portable and there's, there's no way to embed executable arbitrary code in it. However, TensorFlow itself has a very uh, feature rich set of operations. Um, they even say, again, theme of this talk must be big red warnings. Um, so another one in the, the TensorFlow docs, models a code and it's important to be trusted, uh, careful with untrusted code. Uh, they actually recommend that you only load up untrusted TensorFlow models in a sandbox. And of course, every data scientist on the planet is doing that, right? Um, what we actually see then is that some of these opcodes such as read file can be exploited. Um, so we can read arbitrary files from the file system. Um, in this case, we're just doing secret.txt, but we could do etc password, um, anything like that. A um, number of MLOps platforms allow you to just upload a model and run it. So we can start leaking data off of the system um, using read file. There's a corresponding write file, which is probably even more dangerous. So we can start to drop malware on the system. Um, we could overwrite existing files, programs under USR bin, wait for the system to run them. I think, you know, arbitrary file writes like this are quite well known and established as, as mechanisms for, for running code. Uh, and we got base 64 commands and oh, it supports XOR and, and various ways of sort of encoding uh, payloads as well. Uh, there's also a matching files opcode as well. So we can start to, you know, traverse the file system. Um, you see uh, in the, the walk command at the very start there, dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash, get right the way back to the root of the file system. Then we can walk it. We can recurse into directories. Um, we've even got a strings dot regex full match command. Um, so here we're just looking for ASPX files. If we find one, we open it up, we write to it, and we drop a web shell in it. So you know now we've got a web shell dropper uh, through a model. We can start to maintain persistence or get an initial foothold on a system, whatever. Um, Oh, I'll just step back one second there. So, you know, we've even managed, there are enough opcodes within TensorFlow that we can actually uh, write a ransomware just using TensorFlow operations. Um, we kind of got partway through it and thought it was far too nefarious to release that to the public, but I can assure you it's doable. A um, few other sort of model formats worth mentioning. So, Onyx, um, developed by the Open Neural Network Exchange. Again, another protobuf based format. Um, I think it's pretty secure on the whole. It's, it's a fairly decent um, uh, file format for storing models. We have found a few directory traversal vulnerabilities. Uh, we got some CVEs on that earlier in the year. Uh, again, you can see the dot dot slash all the way back to etc password there. So we could upload Onyx models to MLOps platforms and start reading files off the file system. Um, our pretty popular, yeah, pretty popular um, sort of language environment for statistical computing used to lot in uh, sort of military and healthcare, places like that. Um, they have a similar sort of um, uh, serialization format to, to Pickle, but theirs is called RDS, and that again was susceptible to um, code execution, code injection. Um, so we could inject into that and start running arbitrary commands. Uh, we got a CVE on that earlier this year, I think only the, the second CVE in, in ours lifetime. Um, and Scops. Um, Scops is a great one. So um, Scikit-Learn developed this. It was a, meant to be a secure, safe implementation of Pickle. Um, and anything that uses the word secure or safe in the title is usually a prime target for uh, for vulnerable research. So we had a little look into that one. Again, it, you kind of flip things on the head. So instead of having a block list of um, Python functions that weren't allowed in the pickle, it had an allow list. And even within that allow list, we managed to find you know, a few functions that would allow us to, to execute Python code. So again, uh, we got arbitrary code execution through that and another CVE. So yeah, that's sort of the, the landscape for model serialization formats at the minute. Um, you know, the, some of the, the XML based ones we could also exploit. They've been patched. Uh, I think Java's probably quite, um, quite a prime target for injecting into in the future. But yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go and do a little demo now, walk through some, some steganography. 
All right, so we know how to execute code from uh, a machine learning model. Now we will look at how can we uh, make the payload a little bit more stealthy. So we want to embed a binary malware inside a machine learning model. What can we do for it not to be uh, uh, really visible and uh, uh, not to actually break the model um, functionality? Uh, so uh, steganography is a concept that has been there for a long while. <laughs> uh, it involves um, embedding secret payloads or secret messages uh, originally uh, into uh, some other objects like images, for example. So we, we all know about uh, some malware families that like to use uh, steganography to uh, embed the, their malicious payload inside uh, benign-looking images. Uh, well, this concept can be ported to machine learning models because machine learning models are also uh, structured in a way that uh, that um, allows us to uh, replace some least significant bytes here and there and uh, embed uh, a payload that will be totally invisible and uh, will not change uh, uh, the, the uh, functionality uh, of, uh, of the model. Um, this is an um, architecture of a neural network based uh, machine learning model. So we have an input layer, output layer, and uh, a few, uh, a number of uh, hidden layers in between. Uh, and uh, hidden layers is uh, where exactly the magic takes uh, place. So all the computations are done there and the prediction is uh, uh, reached. Uh, and then, um, uh, yeah, we have the output layer that contains the um, the, the output values. Uh, but what are those uh, layers made of? So uh, the layers are made of something that is called a neuron. A neuron is an elementary unit in a, uh, in a neural network. Uh, and uh, what it basically is, is a set of uh, values uh, containing weights uh, for the model, the bias, uh, and the activation function. Um, those neurons are arranged into an uh, into arrays that are called tensors. So if you hear about uh, model tensors, it means actually those uh, uh, neural layers uh, made of neurons. Uh, but they are mostly uh, nothing else. Well, from our perspective right now, they are just uh, floating point values, either 32 or 64-bit uh, floating point values. Um, so uh, if we um, open a machine learning model, if we unpack it, uh, this, uh, in this example we, we took a ResNet model, uh, which is a PyTorch model. And um, PyTorch, as we mentioned before, it uh, relies on the pickle file format, but on top of that it uses a zip, uh, a zip file format to archive all the files together. So we just need to unzip our ResNet model, and uh, this is what we will see that the... the, the directory structure. So the data.pkl file is the file that contains model structure and this is serialized as pico. So uh, this is the file that we will be injecting a malicious uh, a script into, the script that will actually load and uh, execute our payload. Uh, but our payload will be hidden in the uh, model tensors which are uh, stored in the data uh, uh, folder. Uh, all, those, uh, all those files are actually the, uh, the model tensors. And if we open uh, one of those tensors in a hex editor, we can see that it's nothing else but just uh, a set of, uh, in this case, 32-bit uh, floating point values. Uh, so uh, our aim is to hide our payload in one of those files, one of those tensors, by uh, just overwriting a few least significant, least significant bits of each of those floating point values. Uh, in a way that will not change the model behavior, will not change uh, its external appearance, while the hash sum obviously will change, but it's going to be very difficult to, to detect something like that. Uh, so uh, ResNet is not a really large model by today's standards, uh, so it's, uh, it's a biggest layer, uh, uh, contains 9 uh, megabytes of floats, uh, and if we want to embed our payload, we can overwrite up until eight bits, uh, least significant bits of all of those values. Uh, that will still give a fairly accurate model, but to be even more stealthy, we can use uh, just three bits, and that allows us to embed uh, almost 900 kilobytes payload. Uh, and uh, yeah, 900 kilobytes can do a lot. I, I mean, Cobalt Strike Beacon is what, 200, mega, uh, 200 kilobytes, maybe 300, uh, and uh, lots of ransomware samples uh, would fit into that as well. But uh, machine learning models are huge, 
huge. And uh, uh, yeah, this is on the very low, uh, very small side anyway. And even if we want to embed something bigger into a model of this size, we can potentially use more than one layer. We can spread uh, the payload around, uh, across uh, different layers. And that gives us even more uh, space to, to uh, embed stuff. Uh, so uh, we have a, a short demo uh, to um, showcase uh, this exact scenario. Uh, I hope the internet works. No, okay, that, that's not a problem. I have it saved. All right. So uh, we basically develop a few scripts. Uh, uh, they are really short scripts. Uh, I think we are showing them at some point. So f first of all, we downloaded the ResNet model, which is uh, the original model from the Hugging Face. Then we have uh, a script that will embed our uh, binary payload inside the um Oh, I'm sorry. Inside the, uh, a shell code, so it's easier to um, to to actually uh, load it to the memory without uh, dropping it to the disk. Now this is another script. I'm not sure if it's quite visible from there. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but yeah, we are just showing it to uh, to uh, basically show you that those are really short scripts, uh, less than 100 lines of code, including uh, all the comments. So uh, yeah, this is the pickle injection script, and before we had also the script that will embed the, uh, the payload uh, inside the tensors and uh, also the, the stego loader script, uh, the one number three. I don't know if it's visible. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, just like total maybe 200, 250 lines of Python code. Uh, so first, first of all, we check uh, uh, the hash sum of uh, our model just to make sure that it's not been tampered with and uh, yeah, if you go to Hugging Face and check, this is uh, what well, used to be definitely the original checksum of that model. Then we are embedding our um, ransomware DLL inside a Python script inside a shell code, so it's easy to to deploy. So if we look at it, our payload is there um, in in hex, and uh, uh, this uh, this simple Python script will load it to the memory without dropping it to the disk. Uh, now the, the next step is to embed this Python script inside uh, the model's tensor. So the script will look for a, a, a tensor that is big enough to accommodate the payload, and then it will write it into the tensor. Uh, and now uh, the last, uh, well, we, if we check the checksum, yeah, just to say that something has changed, but doesn't tell us anything really. Uh, and last, the last step is to uh, inject our um, loader script into the pico file of uh, of that model. So the loader will uh, decode the payload back from the tensors and uh, uh, run it. Uh, and if we open our hijacked model uh, in an editor, we can actually see that there is this decoder script inside. So this could be obfuscated in a better way, but that's the only portion that is seen and uh, the malware itself is uh, basically invisible. That doesn't change the, the size of the model either, minus the script. <laughs> so now, now we just uh, uh, load uh, our hijacked model into memory using torch.load function uh, in Python. And, uh, and yeah, and uh, that worked really fast, actually. That's why we, we chose this uh, quantum ransomware, because it works in, uh, in seconds, really. Uh, yeah. That's a quantum ransomware uh, readme note. Uh, so yeah, that, that's how easy it is to uh, actually um, embed the malicious payloads inside uh, inside the machine learning models. It takes like five minutes, uh, 250 lines of code, maybe, maybe less. Uh, and yeah, and uh, attackers can upload those models to, for example, Hugging Face or GitHub, and then try to convince uh, uh, the victims to download and run the models. And obviously, nobody is running the models in the sandbox right now, so uh, it, this can lead to uh, further lateral movement. Uh, uh, all right. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's not connecting to the network. Sorry for that. Okay. 
Can't comment. Sorry about that. I made things right. Sorry for that. Cool. Right. Back in the game. Um, so, yeah, we'll just um, have a look at a few, well, slightly different attacks. So, uh, we, we took a little look into the safe tensors file format. Um, again, like Onyx, uh, pretty secure at the end of the day. Uh, it was developed by Hugging Face to uh, replace PyTorch with... Yeah, something that, that just had no um, no option of performing any code execution. Um, they also provided a conversion bot on Hugging Face, so you could upload a PyTorch model or point it at your repository, and um, the conversion bot would convert your PyTorch model to safe tensors and then commit it to the, the sort of underlying GitHub repo that uh, that underpins Hugging Face. Um, However, we found that in doing that, the uh, conversion service was calling torch.load on, on the original model without any, any sort of flags to tell it not to process the pickle. So we could get arbitrary code execution on the uh, conversion service. Um, so yeah, you know, what, what we saw was that this, this torch.load, um, was occurring. Uh, there was even a, a comment in the code saying this is inherently unsafe. Um, and yeah, you know, from, from there, we were able to uh, craft a malicious PyTorch model, upload it to the Hugging Face uh, conversion service. That would execute a payload. Uh, we could ac actually exfiltrate the, um, the token that Hugging Face were using on the back end to commit models to their repository, uh, which means we could have committed any model to any repository anywhere and made it look like it came from the official Hugging Face conversion bot. Um, they, they actually automatically run this over thousands of models as well. So there are about 40,000 odd um, commits made from this model. And I think people People are quite used to just accepting these these days. Um, and especially when you look at the, the diffs, you don't get a diff on any binary files, only source code. So when you're changing a model like this, you know, it would be very hard to see if somebody had injected something malicious or maybe changed the weights and biases of a model or um, injected a, a backdoor into it, for instance. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was a real issue. We also had persistence on the the machine as well, so it, it wasn't even performing the the conversions in like a, a sandbox or a Docker or anything like that. That was a reset between runs, um, so you could technically you know um, have a payload running on there persistently that could inject into models, uh, modify them in any way, shape, or form uh, across multiple runs. Um, just dig into some odds and ends as well. We had a look into to clear ML, so another another pickle one, the gift that keeps on giving. Um, this we we published uh, six CVEs earlier this year. Um, kind of gave us a complete end-to-end -end attack against ClearML. So not only were we able to upload pickle artifacts to ClearML unauthenticated. Um, but we could then sort of set things up in such a way so that when users were um, interacting with ClearML and pulling down artifacts, it would execute the pickle on the end user's machine. So uh, we could exploit the ClearML server and any users of it as well um, using these vulnerabilities. So they've, they've thankfully been uh, patched now for some time. Um, Marta, do you want to walk through packages? Uh, yeah, so uh, this... Um uh, package compromise uh, uh, scenario happened uh, two years ago, uh, where in, in which um, the Torch Triton package uh, on the PyPy was uh, uh, replaced with a malicious binary. Uh, and uh, uh, lots of people downloaded it and actually ran it uh, before it was uh, uh, finally um, fixed. It happened on the Christmas day, so uh, nobody was actually looking at the, at the packages and uh, yeah, nobody was working, so that gave the, the, the attackers a, a little bit more time to uh, actually deploy their malware. Uh, the malware use was really a simple Linux uh, info stealer, so it was reading files like uh, passwd file and sending them uh, through encrypted uh, DNS requests uh, to 
the CNC server. This was a simple package, uh, a, si a simple malware, but obviously it was, was one of the first uh, um, machine learning uh, um, dependencies uh, that uh, were uh, attacked. Uh, and uh, uh, we are expecting this to happen uh, much more in the future. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the um, model zoo type of squatting technique uh, that was described uh, uh, in this article by um, Trillful Fox. Uh, Fox. <laughs> uh, um, this is a really nice article that uh, I recommend you to read. I think there is also a follow-up on this one because this one is from 2023. I think there was a follow-up this year as well uh, in which the researcher uh, tried to create um, accounts on Hugging Face with uh, the names of uh, popular companies like Netflix in this example, but he tried uh, quite a few. And uh, what he uh, actually discovered is that uh, people... Uh, tend to believe that those accounts um, really belong to those companies that was before um, uh, before the uh, be before hugging phase uh, started um, actually account verification so right now uh, there are some of those accounts uh, that are authentic are verified they have a verification sign uh, but uh, that was before that so uh, all the accounts just looked the same and uh, it was difficult to distinguish uh, the, the, the authentic from uh, from the mm, not authentic one. And this is actually not really type of squatting because this this says Netflix, right? Netflix didn't have their present on, presence on Hugging Face back then, so somebody created their account with their logo and uh, actually managed to trick some people to, to join the, that, um, that repository and to to download the models that were posted there. Uh, yeah, this is a way for, uh, for cyber criminals to, to actually uh, convince people to download uh, uh, hijacked models. Uh, on a positive note, though, since we started in this field two years ago, change, uh, things started to change. Uh, so when we started, it was all uh, <laughs> Wild West and uh, the security of uh, software in the 90s. It still kind of is, but we are like maybe in the late 90s right now. So we are moving uh, towards the right direction. So uh, definitely Hugging Face started implementing uh, security issues like the account ver verification, but also they, they implement a simple uh, scanner, uh, scanner, like malware scanner. I think they, they are using... Uh, um, well, some Linux-based scanner, I'm not quite sure, but they use also a Pico scanner, uh, uh, which, well, we we are still able to bypass, <laughs> but it's better than nothing, definitely. Um, uh, Keras uh, introduced the save mode, so uh, right now you can, uh, and it's uh, set to true by default, so by default your model will not, uh, uh, while loading the model, uh, the lambda layers will not be executed, so it just... Uh, loads the weights of the model, and that, that's how it should have been from the very beginning. Uh, but yeah, this, is, this can be overwritten, so if you set it to false, lambda layers will still run. So this is just like a half measure, but again, still better than nothing. Uh, and obviously, uh, also the Hugging Face uh, convert bot was uh, fixed. Uh, um, they added the parameter weights only, which uh, uh, to the torch load function, which w again will just load the weights of the model and not execute any underlying code. So this is also good, but why wasn't it there from the very beginning? We always have to break things for people to actually realize that they need to be fixed. And uh, just a few closing remarks. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's... It, ha it happened before and it probably will happen again. We, we are learning nothing really. And so with each new technology that is so exciting and uh, so um, enticing, everybody just wants to implement it. They rush to, to, uh, to get all the benefits of this technology without really uh, thinking of the consequences, without thinking of security. So security is always an afterthought. And we saw it with cloud computing, we saw it with social networks. And even before we saw it with the internet and uh, 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 email and uh, every, everything really, and uh, now we are experiencing it again with machine learning. And what can be done? Well, there are very many things that can be done, but let's just start with the very basics. So those are the basic steps we should implement for machine learning models. Everything that uh, we just implemented around software many, many years ago, and it's just so simple and so... Uh, uh, 
yeah, intuitive to, to do those things with uh, machine learning. Cryptographic signing, we're actually, our company and a couple of different uh, companies, NVIDIA, I think, and... Uh, yeah, we've been working with NVIDIA, uh, Meta, Google, Intel um, to define cryptographic signing specifications. Uh, actually just been adopted by the OpenSSF, so I'm, I'm hoping we're making some good headway on that front. Of course, it doesn't solve everything. Um, I've been working in cybersecurity for over 20 years. I've seen a lot of malware that's been signed with stolen keys in that time, but at least it goes some way towards, you know, at least proving the, the provenance of models at the end of the day. Yeah, then we have integrity checks, so obviously we should check models for integrity. I know it might take time to compute checksums on 100 gigabyte models, but that, that's something that we should be doing to just be sure that nobody tampered with the model in any way, injected the code or embedded a payload, uh, and security evaluation, so scanning, uh, definitely scanning for malware, for malicious code, and also for vulnerabilities uh, and patching all those vulnerabilities in uh, 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 in uh, machine learning frameworks. So that would be it from us. And if you have any questions, Tom is happy to answer, right? <laughs> oh, I mean, Mart is doing the questions today. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Is, are there any questions from the... Oh, no, you take that. <laughs> um, for the recommendations, uh, integrity checks and signatures, is it something that needs to be applied upstream, like on hugging face or client side, when you download the model, or both? I'd say both, preferably. Um, yeah, uh, I'd always advocate for, for more scanning and integrity checking at every level, but um, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily trust that Upstream is doing it, so right now, if you can do it yourself, um, yeah, try and do it. Because my um, my thinking would have been if we make a comparison with uh, TLS, like with curl, we can always disable TLS verification, so I'm wondering, well, if the end user can always have a flag to skip the, the check. Um, yeah, there'll be that too. I guess we just, uh, and you know, just kind of why we're doing this talk is to try and help data scientists and people in the community to, to be a little more security conscious and aware of the threats they now face. So uh, hopefully people won't be turning those flags off in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hey, is sandboxing, shouldn't sandboxing just be the default? Because consider that the pickle, there's been a pickle talk since 2011 at Black Hat. And some of the hugging face models won't actually run unless you switch it to unsafe. So we almost have to put training wheels on right now for everyone if they're pulling those models, right? We just can't make enough assumptions. Yeah, I, it's a tough one. You know, um, in a way, I'd like to say, yeah, sandbox everything. Um, but practically, doesn't always work. And when you need to connect, um, you know, S3 buckets with all your training data into your models, um, you can't secure it. You can't run it in a sandbox then. Um, so I, I think it's a bit of a cop out from some of the vendors, uh, if I'm honest. Uh, we tried getting CVs on some of them and they just, flat ignored us and said, no, run it in a sandbox. We we don't care about this issue. Um, others, uh, CISA actually came along and just forced the forced the issue and um, took out CVEs on them anyway. Um, so yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to see some of these developers taking a bit more responsibility at the end of the day. Any further questions? <laughs> Uh, first of all, thanks so much for the wonderful talk. Uh, I was wondering if you have any statistics on the prevalence of such malicious uh, pre-trained models on platforms like uh, Hogging Face. Yeah, good question. Uh, we are scanning it and checking it. We've seen a few thousand um, to date, and that's sort of a, a mix of um, PyTorch, Pickles, uh, Keras, TensorFlow. So they're, they're definitely out there and becoming more prevalent. One last question then. Hi, and thank you for the presentation. My question is regarding the tools that we can use to scan for the malware, because I assume there are other platforms where you can download those uh, models, right? 
So yeah. we, what can we, what can we do to detect them over? Yeah, good question. Um, there are open source scanners that kind of work, can kind of be evaded. Um, I do like the, the trailer bit scanner for, um, for Pickle. They have one called Fickling, which is very good. Uh, we probably shouldn't say this in this talk, do have commercial offerings that will do that. So we've, we've been developing scanners for the last couple of years for these things. Um, so yeah, there, there are options. There are choices. Okay, great. Thank you for the awesome presentation. And thank you very much. Have a nice break. <laughs>